I would give up every opinion I hold just to be more like it. You know, compared to the beauty of Jesus, our opinions count for nothing. And so um, we're going to talk about opinions this morning, but understand Jesus alone is worthy. He alone. Uh, I do have some opinions. Uh, you probably have some. Uh, that, that's fine. You're, you're welcome to your opinions. If you, if you want better opinions, just fall into conversation with me. <laughs> you do a lot better. But, um, you know, I, I know that um, you know, when I get together with other pastors, we talk about some things that are really more opinion than they are theology. It's, you know, it's, it's things like, um, uh, do you do weddings for people who don't belong to the church? You know, you can argue that, talk about that back and forth. Will you do a wedding outside of the church building? There's pros and cons on both sides. And, uh, you know, so we, we have our opinions and we share those, but, but they're not that critical. They're, they're not as deeply critical and theological and, and life-threatening the way the question of, shall we wear coats and ties or not? <laughs> and the answer is absolutely wear a coat and tie. And I know in this group, I'm, not, I'm one, one amen. That's all I got. We might be few, but we're right. Of course you wear a coat and tie. If you went to see the president, you'd wear a coat and tie. This is, this is the most important thing you will do with your life, is stand in the presence of Almighty God. You want to wear your best. You want to look your best. You want to be your best. And you just want to, to let God know that you took this seriously. Wear your very best. There's no way that you can walk into church without a coat and tie. Ladies. <laughs> Should we wear a coat and tie? Absolutely not. What a pharisaical thing to think. Why, after all, Christ has set us free, and by the grace of God we stand before God. And when we come before him, we come as we are. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, put on a coat and tie, and then God will give you his grace. He takes us just the way we are, just the way we look, whatever we're wearing. And when we come to church dressed in our normal, everyday kinds of clothes, that just says to God, thank you for your grace that loves us the way they are. You have to not wear a coat and tie. You see, you can start from the same core beliefs and convictions and wind up in two different sides of the equation. You know? And, uh, you know, there are some things that are convictions, and they're really not up for debate. They're not up for discussion. Things like there is a God, and God is one God. He is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that he sent his son to die for our sins. He sent his son. We killed him. God raised him. We need to repent and believe the gospel. The doctrines of grace, the centrality of Scripture, the authority uh, and, uh, of Scripture for us. These things are core. And I haven't mentioned all of them just to say there are some things at the very center and the core of Christian faith that we cannot debate and we do not wonder about. These things are the truths upon which all else is built. And at the center of it all is the sovereign glory of God. But you take a little bit of a step to the next side, and you say, and what does that mean for the life of the church? What kind of governmental structure should we have? Uh, how, should, how should the church be run? Uh, what kind of worship services should we have? Should we have liturgical services with, with robes and processions, or, or should we have a more informal service with just songs and guitars and a, and a, and a helpful word from, from the stage? And, and what kind of music shall we sing? Should we sing the old hymns? Because after all, they are grounded in the faith and they teach us to have our whole lives grounded. Or shall we sing new songs every week so we confuse the stew out of people? No, what, what should, uh, you know what I'm talking about. But we step a little bit further from that and a little bit further. And after a while, we're talking about things that really are opinion based upon the convictions. But how do we apply those? Sometimes we don't see it quite the same, and sometimes it doesn't work out quite um, with the same conclusions for both of us. You know, one of the things that we ought to do is 
heed what Paul says. He says, let's welcome one another. Uh, that word lambano, it means let, let's receive one another. Let's, let's embrace one another. We might have differences of opinions and differences on, on what um, the, the old uh, uh, saints used to call the adiaphorous things of, this, of, of the faith. That's just, just a, a long word that's, that says things that don't really make that much difference. But can we, can we get together on those? Can, in things that are essential to the faith, have that unity. In things that are non-essential to the faith, let us have diversity. But in everything, always have charity, one for another. And so, you know, can, can we get together and welcome one another? Because when we welcome one another and we allow that, you know, people might see things a little differently than we do, we are actually enriched by it. I'm not saying everybody's right and it doesn't matter what you think and what you do, but on, on, these, on these other areas on, on life application where there's room for debate, you know, it, it sort of helps to have somebody else looking at the same problem and from a different place and direction. I was trying to think of an example for this, and naturally the only thing I could think of was artillery. But uh, naval artillery. But uh, and, you know, if if you want to fire off a gun and you want to hit the target, that's what we want to we want the, to, to do the right thing, and that's the target. How do you zero in on that? Well, I stand here, and um, if if you had a naval gun, what what you do is you have one observer, and he's over here, and he tracks where the. I'm not shooting at you, Bob. You're okay. But, you know, he, he tracks to where the target is, and he writes down the angle. And then you have another guy over here, and he's looking at the same target, but he writes down a different angle. And the guy in the middle, being a right sharp fellow, he takes those two angles, and he does the trigonometry of it, and he figures out the intersection of the trajectory of the two ob observations, and he figures out how far away the target is. You see, you're better off with two different perspectives because that's what gives you depth. Are you thankful for your vision? Are you thankful for both your eyes? Are you thankful that God gave us two eyes? They don't see the same thing. They're offset just a little bit from one another. And what the brain does is it takes two different pictures, it puts them together, and it gives you depth perception. That's why if you have an eye surgery or your eye is covered or you can't see out of one eye, you don't have that kind of depth perception. But it's because you have two observations from two different places, seeing two different things, but focused on the same target, you get a sense of depth. That's what happens when we allow each other to have a difference of opinion on these kinds of things. And so this morning, I want to talk to you just briefly, very briefly, about um, how to hold an opinion. Now, Paul, uh, in this passage, is actually talking about how to get along with each other. Saying, what, what do you do when you have this, this kind of, of differences of opinion? He says, well, the first thing is you welcome one another. You agree that, well, you, you have your view, I have my view, but, but that's okay. And then he gives some principles about uh, why that's the case. But I want for us today to think about, on, on the other side of that is, how do you hold a Christian opinion? See, Paul starts out and he says, as for the weaker brother, let me say that, something like that, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome you know, I've, I've always read that and say, what if you are the one who is weak in faith? None of us are weak in faith. It's the other guy who's weak in faith. You know, I'm always the one who's strong enough to have the right conviction. You're, you're a little bit weak in your, in, in your faith like that. I think what Paul means here is either for the sake of argument, that uh, the person who disagrees with you, you think they are weaker in their thought process, but here's how you respond. Um, he, have, he may have a more philosophical view of that. But, the, but basically, he says, as for that person, you're not going to see it. How do you get along with one another? But I want for us to think about how do you hold a Christian opinion? And from this passage, the first thing I think we get is hold your opinions with humility. Paul says it to uh, the, the Roman Christians this way. He says one person believes he can eat, and another says you can't. Let, don't, don't despise the one who abstains, and don't pass judgment on the one who doesn't, because God is the one who welcomes them all. He says, have a little bit of humility. Understand that God is the one who's, who's in charge of this. And not often, but once in a while, you might yourself be wrong. You might yourself not be entirely correct. Hold your opinions with a little bit of humility because that, that will go a long way 
uh, uh, to guard against the reaction that we normally have when someone disagrees with us, which is to get very defensive and to be threatened by a different thought process than our own. But again, we need that different thought process. And he says, welcome that person, not for the purpose of disputes, literally, not, not for the purpose of hammering out the fine details of why they're wrong. Um, I had a friend in college who was uh, deeply into Calvinism. That's not the same as being into John Calvin. Um, I'll just throw this out for you. Calvin was not a Calvinist, uh, but that, that has to do with scholasticism and, and so forth. But uh, uh, the, the point being, he, he was deeply into this and the whole, whole sort of Calvinistic system. And at the time, um, I, I barely knew what it was. So, uh, you know, but every time we, we met, it turned into an argument. I mean, you could not talk to my friend without something about predestination and Calvinism coming out. And I'd say, well, how you doing today? Well, God from the foundation of the world has decreed that today I should be. <laughs> oh, that, that's great. You want to do lunch? <laughs> God from the foundation, yeah, okay. Yeah. We got to the point where we literally agreed not to talk about it. We had to agree not to talk about it because we, you know, the, our friendship was just suffering because there was this constant debate going back and forth. And once we agreed not to talk about it, it was easier to talk about yeah. because we weren't trying to win an argument. We weren't trying to defeat anybody. We were just expressing our, our viewpoint uh, on those kinds of things. And so uh, with, your, with your opinions, with the things that, that you've concluded about life, hold them with, the, with, with humility, understanding that God alone is truth and God alone is the arbiter of what is right and what is wrong. So, so just hold a little bit of humility. Uh, secondly, in your opinions, make sure that they are submitted to the judgment of God. You know, not to your whim, not to what you're used to. And, you know, so many of my opinions are actually based on how I was raised, what I'm used to, uh, what I've seen, what, what's comfortable to me. Um, let, let's be honest about it. Very few of us really submit all of our opinions to the sovereignty of God. Make sure that God is the judge of your opinions and that he has rule over what you think and what you say and how you present that. Uh, I get that out of these verses. So, oh, skip down to verse 4. It says, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? I love that. I love that. Because, you know, it's so easy to, to sort of pass judgment, even on fellow Christians. You know, their worship servant isn't as good as our ser service, and it isn't, by the way. But, <laughs> you know, but it's not as good because they use electronic guitars, and we use electrified acoustical guitars. And, electron, and, and our guitars, which are acoustical, they are actually a lot, lot better because they allow the human voice to be heard, you see. So we, our, our guitars are really much better. Um, of course, that's not true because electronic guitars are really good, and when you have that deep bass going on, you know that bass that's so loud and throbbing that only a bull elephant can hear it, uh, you know, it's just sub, subsonic a kind of sound going on, uh, you know, that, that, that involves you physically and the whole body is involved in worship. That's for you young people. For us old guys, your whole body is involved in a heart attack. I mean, that, <laughs> am I right? That's what it feels like, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. I'll give you guys about 30 years of that and you're going, <clears throat> <laughs> but who are we to judge the servant of another? If God has called somebody else to worship with guitars and drums and it's called somebody else to worship with a pipe organ, called somebody else to worship with drums or sticks beating on a hollow log, who are you, who am I, to judge the servant of another? You know, if you let that thought just roll through your head, you'll start to get an understanding of how, of, of how God deals with us. He deals with us where we are. I'm not where you are. You're not where I am. And so it, it, it should be surprising that somehow uh, sometimes we don't look exactly the same. So Paul says, who are you to judge the servant of another? And then he puts it this way. It's before his own master that he stands or falls. Nobody has to give an account to you for what they think. Yeah. We have to give an account to God. You know, I don't have to explain to you and justify to you what I think. I have to justify and explain it to God. And that's a little bit of a different uh, concept. And so he says, and he will be upheld. I love this. He'll be upheld for the Lord is able to make him to stand. In other words, if you think somebody has a wrong opinion, they're going to have to answer to God. But oh, by the way, you're going to have to answer to God. And do you know how many crazy opinions you've got? I mean, even the ones that you think are rock solid and are really good, let's compare them to the wisdom of God. 
Let's compare them to the opinions of God who, by the way, happened to have created the entire universe, who has absolute wisdom, absolute truth, who has absolute understanding of everything possible and it works it perfectly together in his mind and we're gonna go up before God and tell him our opinions are better than his. I'll tell you what, I'm glad. And I'm just gonna adjust a little bit here. When we stand before God, I'm just so glad we, are, we, we stand before him clothed in the opinions of God. Because his opinion is that Christ is Lord and Christ his son is worthy of all glory and honor. And all that opinion stuff and all the things that we thought were so important and worth uh, arguing about, all that's taken away. We're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And God doesn't look upon us with our weak, inconsequential opinions. He looks upon the righteousness of his son surrounding us. And that's why we are accepted. Okay, we, we read on with that. I mean, that's just a verse of grace. God is able to make him stand. You know? God is able to take us with all our loony ideas and still make us useful. Um, and, and, and you go to verse 10. He says, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why, you do, why do you despise him? We'll all stand before the judgment seat of God. You know, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things Jesus said was, judge not lest ye be judged. You've heard that verse? It's the favorite verse of people who do not believe the Bible. You know, because whenever you bring up the Bible, the Bible says judge not. Am I the only one who hears that all the time? When it comes out, you know, it's just, like, you know, Bible, Bible says judge not, judge not. You can't judge me. Don't judge, don't judge. Well, that's right. I'm not going to judge. I'll just tell you what the Word of God says and let the Word of God judge. But when Jesus says do not judge, he's saying don't you pass judgment on the basis of yourself. He's basically talking about the, the, the issues that we're talking about here. Things where people... Um, had, just view things a little bit different. Don't pass a judgment as if, you know, they've, they've got to be um, entirely the way you think. Because if you do that, that's what's going to come back at you. And so judge not unless you be judged um, in that regard. And so why do you pass judgment on your brother? Understand that God alone is the, is the judge of our opinions. And thirdly, when you hold an opinion, I want you to hold it in humility, surrender to the judgment of God, and when you hold an opinion, hold that opinion for the glory of God. Make sure that it is Christ honoring and exalting and that God the Father is lifted up among the nations, that, that the Holy Spirit has something there in your head that he can use for the glory of God in your service, in your work, and uh, in your ministry. Um, Paul writes it this way. If we look at verse 11, he says, For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. I love that. And so then, each of us will give an account of himself to God, not to one another, but make sure that your life is being lived for the glory of God. And the thing is that when you do that, of course, we know the glory of God in Christ Jesus, and we are able to live for the glory of God only because of Jesus. When we are in Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's, on, that's the only time we can really live for the glory of God. Uh, but when, when that happens, then you'll just find Jesus to be so wonderfully beautiful that you would rather talk about him than your own opinions. And so what I want to ask you to do is just, you know, sometime this week, maybe when you're getting ready to argue with somebody or, or maybe someone says something and you, and you just want to pounce and, and, and those kind of, I, I want you to just step back for a second. Wait a minute, I'm about to express an opinion. I'm not sharing a, a fact from God's word. I'm not, I'm not sharing, a, a, you know, the, the, the gospel as, as revealed in Christ Jesus. I'm, just, I'm sharing an opinion now. And I want to just ask, just ask you to, to step back and look at it and say, am, am I being humble about this? Am I, am I surrendered to God's judgment? And is it something that glorifies God? Because if it isn't, I'm just going to let it go. And we ought to. All right. Let's bow together in prayer. Father in heaven, I'm just so grateful and thankful that um, your opinion of us <laughs> is formed in Jesus Christ, and that you have put us in your son, that we might look more like him. And so I pray that you would give us the, the courage and the patience, and Father, give us the, the, the ability and the strength to surrender our thoughts all to you. And then as we deal with one another, that we would do so with love and mercy as you have dealt with us. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.